It is uh, a Wednesday, midweek, hump day. Bob McCowan and John Shannon with you. Mm. Still safe. Still staying socially distant. Um, <laughs> yeah. Partly. Uh, how about 17 kilometers? Is that is that far enough apart? Well, well, partly for medical reasons and partly because of socially we don't really get along. So. <laughs> Um, you still have my Vegas. Uh, you still have my Vegas sweatshirt. It's hanging in the closet. If you get off your keister and come and get it, um, I'm not delivering it to you. I'm coming I mean, this weekend. I'm coming I've, over. I've never, I've never been to your house. I've never been invited to your house. I don't know no. where your house is. No, no, not no. It, I'm very a reflection of the of the distance in the relationship, um, yeah. above and beyond yeah. the distance geographic. And yet, yes. and yet, you're moving to my neighborhood. Well, I haven't made that decision yet. Oh, please let us alert the Peel Regional Police. Well, I'm I'm more hopeful that you'll move out before I move in. That may that be the, the case. That may, that that may be the, case the deciding thing. factor <laughs> in all of uh, this. Uh, as we sit here right now, um, Tom Wilson has a five thousand dollar fine. Yep. Nothing else. And um, there has been as much of an outcry over this as almost anything this year, and in a long time, in in my opinion, everybody has probably since pro probably since the last Tom Wilson assault on Brendan Carlo. What did he get for that? And he got seven seven games. Well, therein lies the issue for me, is that this is not a one off, this is not a two off, a three off, a four off, or even a five off. This guy is an habitual offender. Now, he's not out with a gun shooting people. He is not committing armed robberies, but he is doing things within his sport for which he has plenty of talent. And I believe that's a factor in this because I think it's mitigating a lot of stuff. But um, what, do you, what do you mean by that? I think if he was a goon in the classic sense, the punishments would have been greater. So if it was John has, Scott, so you know, John Scott or long, Chris Simon or, or, or a, all any of those guys. There's been a long list, John, uh, and, and you know it and I know it and everybody else knows it, of guys who made it to the National Hockey League, not on their skill or talent, but on their ability and willingness to fight because mm -hmm. fighting was considered a an asset to a team teams yeah, well, look for fighters um they didn't just acknowledge them accept them this guy ain't that guy by the way that has not changed in our game well that has not changed he's not that guy and i i think it's important to point out right it doesn't mitigate anything for me right but it's important to point out that the guy has got he's got some talent he, he, he could play, if he never dropped his gloves again, he could play in the National Hockey League, right? Well, not only that, not only that, and as an aside, uh, I had a conversation with somebody yesterday and they said, you know, uh, up until the events at the Garden, uh, Tom Wilson might have been lying to play on Canada's Olympic team. That's how good a player he is. Well, and, and I think it's and, important and, to and I don't think he's in. I don't think he's in the conversation anymore after what happened. Well, do you believe it's because of his hockey skills, not his his dirty play and fisticuffs? Do you believe that influenced the National Hockey League and their decision not to suspend him? Uh, I I think it's one of the reasons. I I also think there are there's I think there are people within uh, the league uh, that think that what he did uh, truly was not under the rules, suspendable. Panarin was on the I, ice face down. Yeah. I oh, I know. Right? Bob, oh, Bob. Yeah, he was, yeah, uh, he was, I mean, he, first of all, w with everything that happened, Wilson punched Wisnevich in the back of the head while Wisnevich was face down on the That's ice. Right. Yeah. Panarin, Panarin came in to defend his teammate, jumped right. on Tom Wilson, like a six-year-old, like a six-year-old, like a six-year-old on a parent. <laughs> yeah. To try to pull him off, and then Tom just uh, Tom pummeled him. Well, again, you can make the argument that in a game that it, that 
condones fighting, um, but punishes dirty hits. Yeah. Uh, well, but I never, and I I never think, really I, understood it, the logic of that. No, but you the, just the fact that you acknowledge that, Bob, tells you the how, how the league differentiates. Just I, the oh, fact I, that you acknowledge it. I understand um, it, but, 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 but. The league condones fighting. If you drop your gloves and throw a punch at a guy, that is What's considered a part of the game. If you mm -hmm. deliver a dirty hit in the course of action without mm -hmm. necessarily having a significant amount of time to think about whether you want to do it, that can be a suspendable offense. Correct. To yeah. me, it's like um, comparing um, murder to petty theft. And, well, that's a little harsh. That's a little well, harsh. But it's backwards. It, it, it's a backward yeah. philosophy. Above and beyond that, if a um, multi-time criminal um, who has been charged with assault or whatever on numerous occasions um, I'm trying to think of, of, of some nondescript um, uh, crime that he could commit. Speeding his, ticket. His history will influence the mm -hmm. courts and the judges, and in, in, if appropriate, a jury, in the kind of punishment. Our system mm -hmm. of law not only allows that, it mandates that. And yet the National Hockey League doesn't well, seem to think that yeah. this is an offense worthy of a suspension? Does this make sense to you? Well, I, 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 they obviously don't because they didn't. Yeah. Why? No, I, I, I understand. I, I, you know what? Because they, the, the feeling, I, I, as I understand that the feeling was that what Wilson did was in reaction to what Panarin did. And therefore, there's an altercation, which, as you say, how the altercation is viewed by all of the people within the game is different than that of a dirty hit. The, well, here, so here's the here no here's the interesting thing, Bob. Um, two things, because I think that there's something that that's, that's going to happen uh, that that uh, it will get more press than maybe even Wilson and and more money involved with it, Wilson. And the the first thing is is that uh, what shocked me was that Tom Wilson was allowed to come back into the game. So even at the moment, the referees, uh, he got officials, two minor, he got two minor, he got 14 minutes. He got 14 a, minutes of penalty. Conduct. Yeah. Yeah. He got 14 and he was allowed to come back in the game. There is no way if you and I were officiating the game, he would have been allowed to come back into the game. Well, there's no way he should have because, because you're, I don't know why you're asking for. No, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I, I'm saying, I'm saying as a referee, no, I'm not. I'm saying as a referee, he should have been, he should have received a match penalty. He should have received a match penalty. He should not have been allowed to come back into the game and have an impact on the game. Th that might have mitigated a little bit of this controversy over the last few hours, a uh, few days. Uh, the other thing is now the New York Rangers have come out of lockstep and have criticized the league. Yes, they have, have criticized George Peros. Um, have said that he should should not be in the position he had. And really, this, from a league perspective, in my opinion, will be viewed far more egregiously than what Wilson did. Um, you know, it, yeah, it, that's it, they will feel... The, hockey league. Yeah, that is very... That's they, very will, they, they, they will feel it is uh, a reflection, a poor reflection on a member club criticizing the league office, the authority of the league office, uh, and it will be interesting to see how the league manages that. I would not be surprised. Just my personal opinion. I have not talked to anybody specifically about this. I would not be surprised to see the New York Rangers find a million dollars. Yeah, I wouldn't be either. Tom Wilson got. But I don't agree 000, with it. Five thousand. Tom Wilson got five thousand, and and Jim Dolan, the owner of the Rangers, will be fined a million dollars, in my opinion, uh, about this. And. Um, and what, what Dolan will tell you is that's the best million dollars he ever spent because he's trying to protect his own players and he's trying to he's trying to tell his fans that we have the best interest of the New York Rangers in mind. So well, I'm, he's trying to say the NHL screwed this up. And I agree with him. And as, I agree with him. As many I, I, as I don't many think I've ever do. agreed with anything Dolan has ever done or said, 
but I and I agree with the New York Rangers in this case. And what would be refreshing? I think he wanted Isaiah hired. What would be really refreshing is if another team or every team, be even better, uh, uh, issued a statement um, supporting the New York Rangers. Actually, that's no, that's an inter- that, that that's interesting. Well, that's and, but you was, no, no. In fact, what well, it, it's funny, um, not, not funny, but it's peculiar. We have seen teams go out of their boundaries and and talk about uh, diversity, how important diversity is, and how things like Black Lives Matters is important. Every team and every league has issued a press release, and the New York Rangers will go out of their boundaries and criticize the league office. And we'll, we'll be fascinating to see how they get managed with this one. Um, usually what the commissioner would tell you is that these are issues that can be discussed to a, to a, a great extent, but within the walls of the board of governors, not publicly, that will be, that's uh, and that's, poppy. that's a pile of poppy. I'm, I'm, that's wow, all about business. Know, I, uh, you know, we're I'm, not interested. Right. Well, we're not interested in dollars and cents here. They are. I just wish well, I think I think they're I think they're I think they're interested in profile. I think they're interested in, in integrity. I think they're interested in public scrutiny. I, I think they're interested in all of it. But I, this is one of those ones where I, I, I think they made a mistake. I got I got no bone to pick with with Wilson. I don't know him from Adam and I'm sure he's a lovely guy. That's what they always say. Right. Guy lived next door to me. Who knew he would, would kill five people. But Oh um, no, hold on. Tom Wilson did not kill five people. Come on. Not yet. Not yet. No, uh, no. Come on. And, well, I'll See, but that's what. but in many ways, Bob, that's part of the problem is, is that we tend we tend to exaggerate, we tend to put things in perspective. And what we're talking well, it about wasn't is the within con- the, it wasn't in the context. You took it in that context in your ever present defense of no. all things a National Hockey League. I get that. Listen, but I've I already said, said they made a mistake. Yeah, they made a mistake, and 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 to find the Rangers, which I think they are, I, I'm positive they are going to do. Sure, they are. Would would equally be a mistake, and it would be nice for the other teams in the league, who, to take a moment, and well, just you think the Washington Capitals agree was, with the Rangers? Sorry, you think the Washington Capitals agree with the Rangers? Okay, so so uh, 29 of the other 30. I, no. I assume the Kraken yeah. can't vote yet. Yeah, they can now. They can vote now, as of well, last Friday. It would be nice, but it's not going to happen. Look, we got to go. Okay. Um, some well, we, we may we may continue. This, this one, this this one's not going to go away, Bob. This one, this one is going to fester for a few more days. Well, we know our next guest, um, J.P. Morosi, while he is uh, noted at it as a baseball guy, um, does does watch hockey. Yes, he does. Uh, does like the game. And um, just for fun, we'll get his two cents when he joins us after these messages. It's uh, Bob McCown. It's uh, John Shannon uh, with you and um, joining us. And I assume you're in that that Michigan place. I um, again in your office. J.P. Morosi is with us. Uh, look, we 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 uh, I, I'm sure you didn't listen to this, but at the beginning of the program today, we got into a rather heated discussion about your other favorite sport, hockey. And Tom Wilson's actions the other night, which resulted in a um, grandiose fine of five thousand dollars and no suspension, which is the, uh, the highest allowed by the collective bargaining agreement that the players well, then you support. need a new collective bargaining agreement, and and they could just, have just got one. They could just have suspended. Got one. Could they not? Could they or could they not have suspended him? They could have. Suspended could they or him. could they not? Yeah, they could. Yeah, sure, they could. And they didn't. Therefore, no. it was about as light as you can get. Uh, Morosi, I don't know if you've seen the video. I don't know if you have any um, definitive opinions on this, but Mr. Shannon and I uh, debated for uh, several minutes at the beginning of the program. I want to give you your two cents. Shoot. Sure. I appreciate it. Uh, here's my thought. I certainly understand and respect the physicality in the game. Uh, it's part of hockey and I think should be part of hockey, but there are lines, as we all know, of what is acceptable on the ice and what is not. And when you take the context of a player like Wilson, who has had numerous incidents of this kind, and he gets off this light, I I think that this is a scenario that called for harsher discipline than what he got from the standpoint of a suspension. I fully realize, as John Mm -hmm. pointed out, 
the fines yeah. are prescribed by the CBA. But for someone who is in this context, um, a, a repeat offender of, of roughing penalties and roughing majors and misconducts of, of this kind, and I do suspensions. think it, and suspensions in the past, exactly. I think it's incumbent on the league to to really draw a firm line of what is is acceptable and what's not. And certainly mm -hmm. all of us who love hockey understand that there are frequently discussions about what is acceptable and what should be handled with supplemental discipline and what is that which occurs during the normal course of a hockey game. And, and I, I appreciate there are some graying of those lines as to as to what exactly is appropriate and what's not. But Wilson is a player who has been disciplined many times by the National Hockey League. And I believe this was a circumstance in which uh, a harsher penalty was called for. Well, I used, I, uh, John will attest to this. I used the phrase earlier that he is not just a repeat offender. He is an, an habitual offender. And in a court of law, those things are, are, are considered dramatically differently in terms of sentencing. And this is the part of the equation that I think the National Hockey League has missed. And John made a, a really good point earlier, I must confess. What? what? The referee called two, gave him two minors and a misconduct. Mm -hmm. They didn't give him a major for fighting. They didn't throw him out of the game. It was almost as if the officials painted the way for the National Hockey League to mitigate the kind of suspension that they were yeah. going to get. Yeah. So they wouldn't make their official look bad. Your thoughts? I'll make this point quickly on, on the last week or so in the NHL. If, if you were to look at just from a standpoint of the actions on the ice and, and the optics of the play, and importantly, the intent and the amount of time the player has to make the decision about his actions, Understanding fully the rules of the game and actions that can result in injuries. Let's pull back to a 30,000 foot perspective, if you will. Which set of actions do you believe were more egregious? Wilson's or Edler's, which occurred in the normal course of play? I would say Wilson's were more aggressive and, and potentially in terms of his actions around around the crease in that scenario more yeah. injurious to the players around him. I realized that there was a dangerous play on Hyman. I fully understand that, but that was in the course of a hockey game and and a defenseman trying to make a play. I, I just thought that Wilson's was I don't disagree. more egregious and mm -hmm. and yet Edler was suspended. Yeah, yeah. Edler got two games. But so uh, I don't agree. I, I don't agree with uh, um with how the league handled this, but to be the devil's advocate, because I like being the devil's advocate. No, you like um, defending what, the NHL. No, I don't. I just, like I, I want to talk things out. I want to talk things out fully. Because I, 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 what we don't want, we don't want, we don't want blinders on and have a myopic opinion and be, and, and just pretend that there aren't other mitigating circumstances. What do you do when a player jumps Tom Wilson? How do you, how does that impact Tom Wilson's reaction, which is what happened. And, and I'll tell you what, if I was a New York Ranger and our Timmy Panarin came and jumped on top of Wilson for me, he's my friend for life. That's the code. But um, how, what, 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 what does that say when, okay, Panarin jumps Wilson. Now, what can, does, does that give Wilson license? It becomes really the question. And it's a fair question, John. And that's where, the the player safety department at the NHL has an extremely difficult job. And mm. I, I we all know that that's that's an understatement. When you look to the future, though, John, for me, I, I frame it this way. When you consider what you want your game to be, to look like, to protect the players on the ice going forward, what do you want? to make in terms of a statement with respect to the actions on the ice and Wilson continually to use Bob's word habitually makes plays on the ice that endanger players. They endanger, they endanger the opposition. And when you consider what you want your game to be and to protect the players from serious injury via reckless plays, his actions, in my opinion, 
require heavier discipline because he has mm-hmm. continually shown what I would describe as a lack of respectful regard for the other players on the ice. And, and, and he's shown that. Yeah. yeah there's and, no question. In a way, right. in a way that candidly, Alex Edler over his long career has not. And, and I think that the context of the players and, and what they have done on the ice over a long period of time belongs as part of the context in each decision that is made, because this is in so many ways, and obviously it's a concerning situation with Panarin for many reasons, but it's, it's about the next Panarin. It's about saving the next opponent from a reckless play from Wilson. Mm -hmm. And if Wilson feels as though he got away without a serious penalty here, he might amp up the aggression on the next player next season, next November, next yep, March. Yeah. Well, and and that to yeah. me, I'm concerned about that player and the message that you send with how you handle this particular play. Yeah, that's interesting you say because somebody I had a long talk with somebody yesterday about this, and and we got it, we got into it a bit, and and he literally said it to me at one point. By the way, he felt Wayne Simmons' response to the Edler hit because Wayne Simmons jumped Edler, who had never been in a fight in his life when Vancouver was in Toronto last week, he thought the Simmons response to Edler was worse than Wilson. Hmm. And that the, and the league did not look at Wayne Simmons, or if they did, they did not think that it was suspendable or worth a fine or worth an acknowledgement because it was in the, the, the context of the game. One, well, one we, quick question. We can go over and over. On, oh yeah. I, but I, I would, so I want to ask John if, right. If, if a major league baseball team publicly denounced the commissioner's office, what would be the repercussions? We saw it with the Rangers and the league office last night in the NHL. What would major league baseball's answer be to a team publicly rebuking? Well, John, that's a great question. And it depends on why and the circumstances. If you take a, an example from this year, recent weeks, MLB's decision to move the all-star game from Atlanta, the Braves released a statement shortly thereafter criticizing the decision and saying that they disagreed with it. Um, And obviously that's a a very nuanced conversation, but that was one recent example in which a team took a position that was directly in opposition to the commissioner's office. And I would expect the commissioner's office expected that Uh, there was no further repercussions that I could tell, obviously, aside from the fact that the all-star game is not going to be in Atlanta, which is a a very significant statement by MLB. I think there are some instances, John, when it comes to discipline where managers might criticize um, the, the discipline that's being handed out. And certainly we're still at a time in baseball where there's a lot of conversation about what is acceptable, what's not uh, in terms of purpose pitches hit by pitches, what, what sorts of conduct should be suspendable and what's not. So I I do think, John, there are some cases in which statements are made against the disciplinary action of MLB. And there is a degree of, of understanding and, and flexibility in allowing people to speak their minds. I, I think that again, everything is contextual and, and it depends on probably who it's coming from and what is being said. We've had players take issue with their suspensions in the past. And I do think, I do think the commissioner's office in baseball does a, a fairly good job of, of allowing people to speak their minds, realizing that's part of the competitive process and then moving on. Well, um, punishment is, uh, exists, uh, to in theory, uh, maybe not in fact, uh, to serve as a deterrent for future actions. Major League Baseball, in my opinion, got one thing right. When the steroid um, situation was at its peak, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Morosi, but they set, they established a policy that if you get caught, you get a 50-game suspension. If you get caught a second time, you get a full year suspension. And if you get a third caught a third time, you're banned from the game. Um, that's accurate, correct? It well, was- what happened was, Bob, they actually initially started with shorter penalties and then as time went on they became more and more significant and so uh, that was a a really a through a collaboration between mlb and the union to present a united front they did not want there to be uh, continual use and they wanted the the punishments to be high enough 
that they deterred the action. So I think Bob and, and John, to use the same example, if if purpose hits, if if unfair hits in hockey were met with lengthy suspensions, trust me, the players would adjust because in baseball, we've seen that happen where in due time, the players have adjusted and, and we see fewer and fewer suspensions. I go back to 2005 and the number of significant players we saw suspended back then. Of course, Rafael Palmero was one of them uh, during those years. Manny Ramirez was not long after him. We have seen players adjust because the penalties have become more and more severe. And, and, and importantly, and I think this is maybe where the, the comparison could be drawn to the National Hockey League, it was the, the players who have played the game cleanly in baseball who were part of the union and said, listen, we don't want people who are cheating to get off with a light suspension. We want the suspension to be significant, to really hit you in the wallet and cost you half the year. And I wonder if, if today we heard from five of the top 10 scores in the National Hockey League or five of the top 10 defensemen, whoever it might be, saying, listen, we want these hits that we saw from Wilson. If in fact that they do, if in fact that's their wish, we want this out of the game. We want those types of actions to be suspended with half of the season, which is what obviously in PEDs uh, we have in baseball. I, I do think you'd see adjustments. And that's just, yeah. that's up to the players. The, the players ultimately have a significant voice in the way the game is officiated and adjudicated when it comes to punishments like this. I think you have hit the nail on the head. This is just as much about how the players help police the game legally within their collective bargaining agreement. And for the longest time, the Players Association in the NHL has always said, we don't want more deterrence. We don't want that. We're, that's why the fine... The league would love to fine a player $150,000. They would love to. They have actually gone, they found ways to do it with their suspension, with their game suspensions. But the Players Association for the longest time has protected both players involved in that issue. You know, Wilson's a member of the Players Association and so is Artemi Panarin. And they tend to protect, try to protect Tom Wilson more than they protect Artemi Panarin. We can go round and round in circles on this thing. And, and not come to um, um, an overall agreement. My point was that baseball has established parameters for suspensions and essentially have, although they've adjusted them, they have not altered from them. They still exist uh, today. Um, and the, the message is, if you are a repeat offender, you will be punished more severely with each mm -hmm. successive time you break the rules. The National Hockey League has never done that and chooses to decide suspensions based on the individual incident more than the history of the player. And that's the problem that I have with all of this. Um, moving on, I want to address something else in the sport you spend most of your time looking at, and that is baseball. I'll tell you one thing that I have seen this year more than I've seen ever before, and, and maybe it's just me, Morosi. You know, maybe I've spent too many hours cooped up in this house, in this COVID environment, and, and I haven't got enough oxygen in my system, in my brain, which other people have suggested is, is highly probable. Um, do you think Major League Baseball has told umpires to call a bigger strike zone in well, order to speed up the game? That is a very interesting question, Bob. And... A couple of things are going on. Of course, at the minor league level, we are seeing in some leagues, uh, one in particular, the automated strike zone being put into play. Yep. And that could be the future of baseball uh, and having the, the strike zone called by, by the rule book, if you will. By technology. Do, by tech, yes, by technology via the exact rule book strike zone technology. Yep. And interestingly, gentlemen, one of the really fascinating parts of this is that they would calculate the the strike zone not based on the stance of the player as the player steps to the plate but rather the listed height mm -hmm. of the player on the roster so if you want to crouch down low and make your strike zone four inches tall if you will if you have <laughs> the, the old eddie goodell uh trick oh, yeah. years ago in bill veck 
it, it doesn't matter because your pre-programmed strike zone will be based on your height and not how you present yourself at the plate. Mm-hmm. Such an interesting nuance of baseball, but that's how the sport works. And so your, your strike zone will be programmed in to a database. And then when you come to the plate, it will be punched up where Jose Altuve's strike zone will be shorter than John Carlos Stanton's, if you will. Sure. And, and then the, the automated strike zone will be called accordingly. I would point out to you, Bob, that, that in preparation for this, there has been a, a renewal of understanding what the strike zone is as written in the rule book. And from what I have heard from people who are around the game, players, of course, who played the sport for a long time, they do say that the high strike is being called much more frequently now than it was 20 years ago. And, and that is one of the reasons why we are seeing such a diminishment in offense in the sport, because a high fastball, especially one with movement, is nearly impossible to hit. when it's when it's at the top of the zone if it's between your belly button and your letters and it's 98 with tail on it there's a reason why if you look at mike trout's historic heat map if you will the spot that he that is hardest for him is up over the plate that is a very mm-hmm. hard pitch to get to and so why are we seeing the the high strikeout totals well, it's because pitchers know this. They've adapted to the different zone and the predominant way of pitching. If you heard years ago, you think about the late, great Roy Halladay, it was all about sinker slider. And eventually he mixed in a cutter. It was sinker slider. That was the predominant method of pitching around 2005, 2006. Well, now it's fastballs up and breaking balls down. There's not as much of a conversation around sinkers or the cutter is obviously still there, but the old sinker ballers to get the ground balls, that's not the method of pitching now because of the launch angle swing. And so the pitcher, if you think about this, they're throwing the ball above the plane of the sweeping lower swing. So they're throwing the ball over that plane. And then when they want to throw a breaking ball, they spin one down off of that plane. And that's why I want to get, I want to get back to the, I want to get back to the original question because what I am seeing and I don't know whether we're seeing bad umpiring or whether we're seeing something deliberate from baseball. I am seeing pitches everywhere, below the strike zone, call the strikes, above the strike zone, inside and outside. We see the little box on the screen. Um, yeah, an umpire misses the odd one, but I'm seeing it regularly and consistently. And what I'm seeing specifically is they aren't missing strikes and calling them balls they're seeing balls and calling them strikes and and that's the question that i have what's going on i think bob that that does happen because of human error i am not sure that it's happening any more frequently now than it ever has i think the big difference is we have that box on the screen to tell us (laughs) well i've seen the but we've seen the box for years it's a different box now but i'm telling you i'm seeing it and every, I, I, and every umpire is, and every umpire has hated that box, and their union has tried to v- get it vetoed how many times? Well, we we do talk about it. It, it is an ongoing subject of discussion, to be sure. I, I I do think this. First of all, it's early in the season, and w- w- we might see some of those trends normalize as the year goes along. It's also a reality that batting average is the lowest. That there was an Associated Press story on this recently. I think it's an important point to make. The batting average in baseball in April was the lowest it had been through one month of the season since 1968, the year of the pitcher, the year that prompted a change in the mound itself. So Mm -hmm. to your point, Bob, hitters are at a disadvantage right now in general. And so anytime, I would say this, anytime that a ball outside the box is called a strike, we're going to notice it more because hitters are already at what appears to be a historic low point in their ability to put the ball 
in play. We, we have well, some- uh, but, but that's, you know, this as well. We got to take a break here, but you know, that is baseball's fault. That is the people who run baseball who have empowered hitters, sought out hitters, told hitters, rewarded hitters for hitting home runs and devalued the, the, the singles hitter, devalued the guy with good bat control, devalued, and fans have done this too, devalued batting average. And that's why you've, you've got the situation you've got, yes or no. I agree to an extent. Uh, arbitration salaries reward power, but I would also make this point quickly, Bob. Look at recent years and recent champions. The Washington Nationals, the Boston Red Sox in particular, excelled in the realm of two strike hitting two out hitting and were veteran laden teams the nationals were the oldest team in baseball when they won the world series in 2019 names like howie kendrick come to mind adam eaton Mm -hmm. ryan zimmerman so you're right while the financial rewards tend to be for the power the winning at the end often comes from players who make contact and i hope because i think that's the best version of the game I hope more teams, the Royals are one of them, who really champion contact and fluid play and better at bats because I think ultimately that wins. That well, was a yes. Bob. That was a yes. Bob. Ultimately, it costs less, and that's why the Kansas City Royals do it. Uh, we'll take the break and come back with more. John Paul Morosi is uh, with us back after these. McCowan and Shannon and uh, JP Morosi uh, with us uh, on the program today. Uh, Shannon, you haven't said much. I, I kind of hogged the conversation for a little bit. No, it's okay. I, I, you know, we have, uh, on our show, we have not addressed at all um, Robbie Alomar uh, and the uh, the removal of Robbie Alomar as someone of note in the Blue Jays and in, in Major League Baseball. Is there a and debate? I'd be curious to think what, no, no, I'd be curious what, what, what John's reaction is. I, no, I don't think there is a debate at all, but I'd like, I'm just curious to yeah. someone outside of the, the realm in Toronto uh, would think about this. John? I think baseball handled this the appropriate way, and the Blue Jays did as well. Uh, this has been a robust conversation around the game in the last year, uh, various aspects of, of social responsibility and, and just respect for everybody who's part of the baseball family and and everybody who is intersecting in any way with people who are in the baseball family, that people who are part of Major League Baseball have a responsibility for fair treatment of everybody and and standards of good conduct. And I applaud baseball for being thorough about this. Uh, A victim came forward, reported uh, the offense to MLB MLB appointed a, an independent investigator to look into it, and the findings were obviously kept in private in terms of the specifics of the offense, mm-hmm. but I, I applaud the victim for coming forward. I applaud the way MLB and the Blue Jays handled it. Uh, of course, Robbie has also resigned from his position with the Hall of Fame. This is a very serious matter, and as someone who was involved in baseball every day, I think it was important that baseball handled this in the manner in which it did because last summer and last year, there was a lot of conversation around what, what obligations sports leagues have as social institutions. And when someone brings forward a credible allegation against someone in your baseball family, you have to look into it. And it was, by the way, I think it's important to note MLB looked at it in in private, this was not something where it was brought up to the public's attention months ago, and then the investigation went on. It was all handled confidentially, and I applaud the way the victim handled everything here, and, and um, clearly the victim was not seeking any attention. We don't know the victim's name, and nor should we, but we don't need to know those specific. Uh, considering, shoe, considering, considering Shoeless Joe Jackson, not eligible for the Hall of Fame, Pete Rose, not eligible for the Hall of Fame. Uh, I would view what Robbie Alomar did was worse than what both Jackson and Rose did. How is Alomar still in the Hall of Fame? Well, and that is a great question, John. That's something where I believe, as a, a someone who votes for the Hall of Fame, that the Baseball Writers Association of America should take a very serious look at the potential of removing his plaque. For now, it is still there. 
And mm -hmm. uh, Chairman Jane Forbes Clark of the Hall of Fame indicated that the voting on Alomar obviously occurred with the information that we had about his career at that point in time. But circumstances, of course, are different now. And, and Chairman Clark's statement did not include any sort of reference to reevaluating his place in the Hall of Fame in terms of being honored in the Great Hall. There was no reference made to that. But I'm speaking to you as a member of the baseball writers, and I, I say for, for him to be honored by our group, I think we as the baseball writers need to discuss it and need to talk about what we believe to be the fair way to handle this matter. This is a very significant offense, obviously, and a, a very important piece of information that has come to light after we voted on him, years after we voted on him. And I think it's appropriate for us to at least have a discussion about what our wishes would be. And ultimately, we as the baseball writers provide a, a service to the Hall of Fame um, out of our own professional obligation and, and honor, really, uh, to, to help them decide who's in the Hall of Fame. And so all we can do is if we came together as a group and, and it would be an interesting discussion about what we, what we could even do. But if, if we had, well, that's a, the point, let's say, let's say we had a vote among our membership currently about current hall of fame voters. Do you want to keep him in the hall or not in light of this new information that put him on the ineligible list? That to me is the, is the crucial part of this. He is now on the ineligible list. And, and when you're on the ineligible list, you should be ineligible for the Hall of Fame. That's that's right. Your point. That's my point. Uh, right. That's that's the Pete Rose. That's Pete that's Rose. Pete Rose example. And yep. and certainly there are other. There have been, and I'm sure will be in the future, allegations brought forward of various types against people who are in the Hall of Fame. Uh, but the reality is, this one, the the circumstances as they exist today. This one resulted in an investigation by MLB. This one resulted in MLB putting him on the ineligible list. And that is what makes this allegation and this offense materially different from any other sort of character conversations that may exist around other players who are under consideration for the hall or already in the hall. We have, we have like less than two minutes here. So I need a quick response to this uh, for clarity. The baseball writers have the emp are empowered uh, through their vote to decide who gets into the baseball hall of fame you do not however through vote or any other means have the ability correct me if i'm wrong to determine who should not be in the hall of fame once they are there is that accurate as far as i know bob that is accurate and and we we vote them in as you describe once they're there that process obviously is within the hall of fame the the plaque exists in a hall within the hall that mm -hmm. the hall of fame presides over and so but quickly quickly jp because we're really short on time sure do you think that if there was a an overwhelming vote on the part of the writers asking the hall of fame to remove robbie alomar who was elected by you how do you th do you think that would be how do you think the baseball hall of fame would receive that it's a great question. I think they would have to, and they would consider it among their board of directors. Hmm. Uh, we Has don't anybody know. been removed? Has anybody ever been removed from the not baseball hall of fame? No, no not neither to mine. No, no. no. Uh, we must off, and we apologize because um, uh, we, we, we there's many places we wanted to go, and we never have enough time to chat with you. Um, we enjoy our conversation so much. We hope you do too, and uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll join us again somewhere down the road. Thank you, JP. Bob and John, my pleasure. Uh, it's always my pleasure and look forward to the next one as well. Thanks so much. John Paul Morosi, back after these messages. Never enough time for John Paul Morosi. And we probably took too much He'll time. Be back. He'll be back. He'll be back. Have you, am, am I the only one who has noticed um, the, the ridiculously bad umpiring that we've seen this year? And, and I just wonder, it, it's so bad. I, I just, I, I can't help but wonder if baseball has asked told the umpires we got to get the time of games down call more strikes is that possible um 
uh, I would be shocked about that. Uh, you know, I, I actually think in many ways, comparable to what we talked about with officiating in the National Hockey League, Bob, I think this might be the pushback by the umpires themselves uh, to, to fight the automation of the game, to fight technology. Uh, and well, why would you want to be? I think you, uh, that, that doesn't make sense, John. They, 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 they're calling balls be, strikes. Be, because they're trying to tell people that the umpires are still in charge. Well, but they're not in charge if they're making mistakes deliberately. And I'm not saying I'm not I'm not saying it's right, Bob. I'm just well, I just you know how powerful the umpires used to be. You know how how umpires have tried to maintain that power. Oh and it's the one sport more than any other that the union has always had that leverage. Yeah. Well, uh if this is if this is their plan, they're doing it ass backwards. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be the first time. It wouldn't be the first time that a small group tries to push the rope, Bob. Yeah, don't pull the rope, push it. Yeah. Uh, for uh, hey, I, I, tomorrow Haley Wickenheiser tomorrow, Bob. Haley yeah, Wickenheiser we, tomorrow. Um, greatest female hockey player ever. Mm -hmm. Hope you'll join us for that. Until then, for uh, Shannon McCowan. Goodbye. Everybody.